Amen. All right. How's everybody doing today? Good. All right. Good, good. Glad to hear that. Good news. Well, we are going to return to the book of Philippians today, uh, chapter 1. And so excited about that and uh, want to uh, thank all of you who have uh, who, who shared with us. Uh, we, we missed last week. Uh, schedule got a little over overcrowded, but we are back in gear today and uh, into Philippians chapter 1. And so I want to invite you to turn with us to Philippians 1. And you may want to mute your phone if you have unusual background noise. That may help us a little bit. Uh, 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 yeah, there's some pretty good static. So uh, you may want to mute your phone uh, if you have some significant background noise. All right. Okay. Philippians chapter 1. And uh, so, uh, by, w by way of recap, uh, we talked in Philippians 1 last week, and we... Uh, Pastor, there is a problem. Your voice is, is crackling. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, I'm at the far end of the building. Um, I don't know if I can help that. I'm not sure try. But someone's Bible is right next to their phone, and that's crackling on my end, so you're probably getting some double <laughs> feedback there. If we might try to mute our lines, that may help a tad, and then I'll see what I can do with this phone over here. Let's see. Is that any better? Okay. Uh, well, Philippians chapter 1 is where we are today. <laughs> so I, I, I can't do but so much, so please bear with me, and hopefully the Lord will keep us. This is the best we have, so I have to press on lest we miss our time. So I'm going to try what I can. And meanwhile, if your phone is right next to your Bible, you please mute your line. It would help me so much. All right, Philippians chapter 1. We studied Philippians 1 together last week. We began this study together, and we talked together about the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Philippi from a Roman jail in Ephesus. We talked about the uh, geographic location that they are uh, in, in Greece, in, uh, in essence, which is there in uh, the edge of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, it is a peninsula of sorts, and so if you, if you go due north of east and of, of Greece, forgive me, and hook east, you will run into Philippi. This is one of the churches Paul planted in Asia Minor, which is today known as Europe, uh, which is just east of Italy. And there, Paul planted this church, began his work for Christ there, missionizing, evangelizing, and reaching others for the Lord. And uh, as the Bible reminds us, particularly in this book of Philippians, this letter he writes, that as a result of Paul's work, he encounters the opposition from Caesar and Rome, who are diametrically opposed to the gospel of Christ. We talked about that last week. Remember, class? Amen. So we talked last week about uh, Caesar's uh, push against Paul and Caesar's uh, antagonism of the gospel, for Caesar believed he was appointed by God and that there were none other. And so uh, even Jesus himself, Caesar made uh, uh, ample advances against the gospel and the church of Christ. And so Paul is writing this letter under those circumstances. He's been now under arrest uh, and writes from a prison cell to whom he's, he's where he's been given a, a dictator of sorts, meaning a person who takes dictation. Uh, they share Paul's notes, and then his letters are then sent out. So uh, there is some give and take Paul has, yet Caesar makes sure that he is under guard, lock, and key. And so here in Philippians 1, we talked last week about how Paul opened that letter uh, with some uh, thanksgiving. Uh, he greeted the people of Philippi with grace and peace. 
And now here we talk today, we're going to talk today about verses 11 through 14, when Paul moves from the opening of letter into the body of the letter and begins to raise some context that is very familiar to all of us today. It's quite a few parallels between what Ephesus was enduring and what Paul is enduring. So I hope my sound is good on the, on the phone line and we're thankful for those who join us on the stream. So if someone would be so kind to read for us Philippians chapter 1, verse 11. Verse 11? Yes, ma'am. Okay, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes to Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Yeah. Uh, oh, um, you know what? Forgive me. If you would read verse, uh, verse 9 and 10 also. Sorry, sorry about that. That your love may bound, abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. All right. Thank you so very much. So here, Paul has opened the letter, as we discussed last week, uh, talking about uh, thanksgiving, grace, peace and prayer. Uh, and then uh, he talks a little bit of quickly about verse seven, uh, what's on his heart and that he's in chains for defending the gospel. And then after he sort of lays out his situation, which the people of Philippi are familiar with, uh, with, with which they're familiar, then he turns to uh, what he hopes for them. This is my prayer. Your love may abound more and more. So in other words, Paul informs us very quickly that in this really challenged situation with these obstacles he's facing and attempting to get the message of Christ across, he has got to keep his mind and the minds of God's people on, on God's love for their lives and on the way of Christ for their journey. He says in verse 9, that your love may abound more and more. And then verse 10, as Deacon has read for us, that you may be able to discern what is best, may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, Filled with root righteous. So, so what does it sound like Paul is saying here in these first few verses, these verses of 9, 10, and 11? He's in chains. He's uh, it, 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 under captive guard, uh, it, and he's writing to the church, yet he says these words, uh, that your love may abound, that you may be able to discern, that you're filled with the fruit of righteousness. What do you think Paul means by saying these things? Yeah, I would. Start. Yeah, I think it's a great start. I would agree. Other thoughts, anyone? And I also think he's saying, use the tools that we've been given. You know, we know the characteristics and attributes of God. All right. Um, being um, meek and and kind. Okay. And so, uh, like Donna said, he's telling us, you know, be sincere about this. Do what God wants us to do. Be obedient. Okay. Okay. All right. Others, any thoughts? Okay. So, I, yeah, wonderful insight and thoughts there that these, these ideas that you've shared and that Paul expresses to us come not, right? So Paul's not sitting in the sanctuary, right? Everybody there? Yes. Yeah, he's not in the sanctuary. He's in a, he's in a Roman jail cell. 
and he, he informs them or he shares with them, admonishes, encourages them to abound more and more in, in, in knowledge and insight and love and so that you may be able to discern what is pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Someone on the stream, Kimberly, said she, she heard your comment and said she'll use that tools we have been given. Amen. Thank you for that. Yes, yeah, so this idea being that Paul asked, what struck me about it was much of what you all shared, that in this moment of hardship, Paul encourages the church to love one another. Amen? That, yeah, in chains, under guard, lock and key, he doesn't tell them, come get me out of here, right? <laughs> Break this door down. You know, go approach Caesar. Advocate for me in the court. You know, send, maybe he did some of that on the side. But as it relates to what he wants to share with those who believe to have furthest uh, for, up for, foremost in front in their mind is that they that that their love abound more and more, that they discern what God would have for them to do, and that they're that they're filled with the fruit of righteousness. So the idea being that Paul's reminding them that even though this obstacle is in their way, that they got to hold to God's hand and continue to keep loving one another, right? So that, so that, so that to, to the point made here and the sister on the stream, these tools that we've been given can help us to discern and help us navigate the obstacles we have to face, right? Because we all know in the world around us, we do the flip side of that, right? We say, well, if, I'm, if I got an obstacle, if I'm in a jam, if I got trouble, if there's a problem going on, I know, how to, I, I know how, to, how to roll up my sleeves and handle business, right? But Paul said, no, no, that ain't what we're about. He's saying even when obstacles appear, that's when we need to love each other more and more. He says in verse 9, that your, he says, this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. In other words, I'm in jail, but I want you all to take care of each other. In other words, uh, there is some injustice going on. There's some hatred about it. There's some violence around us. But I want you all to keep on taking care of each other in the love of Christ. I want you to keep discerning what God would have us to do. I want you to be filled with righteousness so we can deal with the craziness all around us. Amen? Amen. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Peace be still. Absolutely. Wonderful point, Deacon Sandy, that that though there, there is trouble around, there are obstacles ahead, there are challenges to face, there are hills to climb, rivers to cross. That's right. Peace be still because we can't cross the river with anxiety overruling us, right? With anger running through our veins, with frustration tensing us and stressing us out. Well, you know, we, we, we've got to learn how to be still ourselves. And I think, I, I don't think we can overstate the fact that Paul starts that short pericope 9, 10, 11 by saying, uh, this is my prayer, right? First of all, he's still praying, amen? Mm -hmm. He's still praying. But even though his situation is the worst of all, and though we would dare say when, we, when we're in the worst spot, right? We'll, we'll, when we're in the worst place of everybody around us, we feel like, well, listen, I got an excuse not to pray. I'm going to go cut somebody out. I'm going to put my hands on somebody. I'm going to take care of this my way. Paul says, no, this is my prayer. And from there, he says that your love may abound more and more. Not that you get angry. Not that you turn left or right. Not that you decide to throw up your hands and curse Caesar. That your love may abound more and more. Amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so, so Paul speaks from this context of the Roman jail cell uh, in Ephesus where, where writers believe it is that he's located this time. He's writing in somewhere between uh, 60 and uh, 50, 60 and, forgive me, 40 and 60 AD. Uh, and, and he is attempting to speak to the concerns of the church at Philippi that he planted in hopes that they'll remain strong through it all. Other thoughts on those verses, anybody? <laughs> myself, yeah. my well-being, and what I need to do to get out of this prison. 
as opposed to saying to everyone else, these are the things you need to do as you build your relationship and love with God and others. Absolutely. Great point, Donna. And I think it's a helpful point for us that when we get in these places, because here's the first thing, it happened to Paul, it's going to happen to all of us. Amen? Yeah, we're, we're going to face obstacles. We're going to be in tight spaces. We're going to be in predicaments and challenges. And since that's the case, to your point, Donna, what Paul reminds us is rather than allowing the situation to overwhelm and overburden us with how will I get out, what Paul is saying, now Paul's not ignoring his situation because he says it, in fact, he says it three or four times in just this chapter. I am in jail now, right? So, so Paul, is not, he's not ignorant of the fact that he got trouble. But what he's saying is, I'm not going to allow my trouble to deter me from being who, who God has me to be because it's being who God would have me to be that ultimately will get me out of the trouble. Amen? Yeah. So that, so, that, so that this challenge Paul faces, the challenge we face, the obstacles in our communities and around us, the decisions that we have to make in our families, amongst our friends, the, the, the career choices that are ahead of us, the economic issues we face, all the things that we could take into account. What Paul is saying is in these moments, let our love abound more and more. Let us decide in these moments that God will have God's hand on us and we're not perfect, but let us do our very best to, to love more and more so, so therefore we can discern. And I don't want to over, I don't want to wear this out, but I do want to say, I want to press this point to say that I think in, in, in maintaining love in our hearts in really stressful situations, we're able to discern. So look at what Paul says. He says, your love may abound more and more in, the, in knowledge and depth of insight. In verse 10, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless with their Christ. So in other words, he's saying we, we've got to keep loving each other because love is what helps us stay in rhythm with who God is. At the minute we step out of that, right, we sort of step out of our ability to hear what God has for us. So when we, when we allow hatred or violence or evil or contrition around us to overwhelm us, to become us even, then we run the risk of missing that next step God has. That doesn't mean God's thrown us away. That doesn't mean God's this is God's self from us, but we in essence have sort of stepped out of the path God has because we've stepped out of loving each other. Hard to do at times, amen? But, amen, <laughs> hard to do at times, but, but we got to learn how to, how to love one another in difficult times. And to your point, Don, I think it's so important how when times get heavy on us, we don't allow the times to change our hearts for people, our, our character, our compassion, our empathy uh, for what people around us are going through. Uh, it's so important. So important. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts, anybody, before we move on? Okay, let's look to verse 12. Somebody, if you will, read for us Philippians 1, verse 12. Yeah, which that, that sounds perfect. Verse 12, yep. So here, so Paul Paul starts this verse saying, now I want you to know that now is a, is a, is a, a clue, right? Sort of a, that's sort of a signal. Okay, I'm shifting gears here. He's, he's, he's opened the letter. He's greeted everyone. He's informed of what he's going through. And he says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters. So, so he is... He, is, he gives them a, a precursor, if you will, of what he is about to say and do. And so uh, it, it, it underscores sort of the literary genius of Paul, right? That he is, he, he, he's not writing aimlessly. He's writing to keep the attention of the hearer. He is writing so that those who read the letter or read it to others will continue to follow along. And he's writing so that they can sort of make these, the, the pivots in the, content of the letter with him. So he says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters. And then just the value of that phrase, brothers and sisters, right? So, so back to Donna's point and others earlier, 
that brothers and sisters, it, it's Paul's way of reminding them we're all together. We're brothers and sisters. That though I'm in prison and though you are there, both of us, it's Paul's way, both of us are, are wrestling with some things. Both of us are striving to, to do God's will together. And regardless of where we are on that spectrum of what we endeavor to do for God, we're ultimately brothers and sisters in Christ. And I think that little small caveat is so important because to the points made earlier, sometimes, sometimes when we get in, we get in some trials and some tribulations, we stop calling each other brothers and sisters, though we 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 got some other names, amen. We, we, <laughs> we, <laughs> sometimes sometimes we Sometimes we resort to some other names, you know, some nicknames and some not so kind names. <laughs> but Paul, he maintains his compassion, his love uh, for his people and says, brothers and sisters, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. What do you think about that? Hmm. I mean, he's sitting in prison, perhaps given that he's got more time to think about what's on his heart mm -hmm. in relationship to God. Okay. And I'd like to add to that that he's keeping the people at peace. Ah. Lighting up. You know, because we get carried with somebody. Jesus is in, I mean, Paul is in. Look how they're treating him. He's, he's quieted that. Yeah. He's, he's quieting the movement and saying, now here's what I want you to do. Yeah. Don't go out and start a riot. You know, don't, <laughs> don't, don't, right. don't beat on the doors of the jail. That's right. It, it, it's saying, it, this is, be at peace. I'm at peace with you. Be at peace with me. Mm. And his voice. That's a powerful observation, Deacon Sandy, powerful observation that this idea that Paul would have them to be at peace together. And uh, I'm, I'm going to stop there. That's your point. Anybody else? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, he is. Thank you for that, Minister Martin. And so I think those two points are really important together. The idea that Paul is speaking to, uh, to reassure the people of Philippi and the Deacon Sandy's point that, that Minister Martin uh, uh, added on to there, that Paul is talking at this point when he says that what has happened has actually served to advance the gospel, in a way, it's Paul speaking to the inner self of the people of Philippi. So, so to Deacon Sandy's point, he's encouraging them to both 
to be at peace together, to love one another. And that family speaks to their emotional, their mental, and their spiritual well-being. That what Paul is dealing with is not just uh, how the gospel will be spread. That's Paul's main goal, no question about it. But I think this is so valuable for us right now today because Paul takes into account to Deacon Sandy's point that what is going on with him easily stirs the emotions, easily brings anxiety to the mind, easily stresses the heart. And so Paul's trying to say, hey, we, we can't lose our cool over this. Amen. We, we can't we, we can't all fall out. We, we cannot uh, allow ourselves to get mentally and emotionally overwhelmed. So he says, this has actually helped to serve the advance of the gospel. So Paul has, has, has looked clearly at what's going on. He realizes the stress it causes. And I want to park the car for a second here to say, I think this is so important for us as Christians, right? That, that as to Paul's point here, that we don't overlook the needs of God's people for our fervor to deliver the gospel. See, sometimes we get so deep into the Bible that we miss the people who we're trying to share it with. We miss the fact that they ain't eating today. Uh, they're going through something really crazy. Their, their last night was not very nice, or their last week they got laid off, or their neighborhood is going upside down, and we're at the doorstep or wherever we've met that person preaching and testifying, when in actuality what they really need to hear is, God's going to take care of you and things will be all right. Uh, or I, I can help you find another job, or, or I know, I know uh, someone who's hiring, or I know where you can find some food for your pantry, uh, some, some, some gas for your car, a, a bus ticket to get to work, or where you got to go, that Paul speaks to the daily life reality of the people at Philippi by saying, this has actually served to advance the gospel. That this, to Deacon Sands' point, this trouble we found, we can not only overcome it, but it'll help us if we hold on. Amen? Amen. Yeah. He, he's, he's trying to, Amen. he's addressing what could be a very anxious situation and could really turn the church inside out emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. Really important for us today, considering all that we are going through. Other thoughts, anybody? All right. As we are going. I think sometimes we may individually go through things in life and it's really difficult and we think, why is this happening? And then when we look back, we say, oh, well, it wasn't all about me. That was God working through me for the furtherance of the gospel. All right. Amen. That's right. That, that's, that's, that sometimes God uh, allows things, right? It's called the permissive will of God. That sometimes we, we don't believe that God uh, creates trouble. We don't believe that God uh, you know, would put us in some hardship intentionally. But, but I do believe that God sometimes permits us. God permitted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to stay in the fire furnace a little while. God permitted Daniel to be in the lion's den for a little while. He didn't make a lion's den. He didn't throw Daniel in it. He didn't make the fire. He didn't put uh, 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 the, the prophet in that. But, but what he did do was he permitted them to be there. He permitted Jonah to be in the belly of a whale. He permitted Esther to be in a rough spot. He permitted Hagar to be shifted out into the wilderness. But what God did was he used those moments to make those heroes and sheroes stronger. And so to your point, Deacon Gorham, he uses, I believe God uses those situations not only to make us stronger, but to your point, Deacon Gorham, he uses them also so that we can be a blessing to people around us who are observing us as we go through. So you're right. I think, I think you're absolutely right that Paul essentially says, this isn't all about me. I need to be thoughtful about those who are around me. And I would say, family, in this time right here, as we think about our family members, our close friends, uh, our children, our colleagues, our coworkers, uh, people with whom we have relationship, people do look to us. It doesn't matter, you know, we don't have to be preachers and teachers, but people look to people they care about, they trust, uh, and, and, and whom they hold some, some honor and respect for how to navigate tough times. Amen? Amen. Yeah. 
We, we, we look to those people and say, well, let me see how they're getting through this craziness. How are they surviving this? What's going on? So to Deacon Gorman's point, Paul realizes this ain't all about me. I got to be sure that my people survive this nonsense. And so I think all of us, uh, to some degree or another, right, God has given all of us some calling uh, beyond ourselves, some uh, point of influence in somebody else's life to, for which we, we should be thoughtful as we go through, as we endure challenges, as we overcome trials and tribulations, as we meet good times and high moments on the mountaintop, to be mindful that while God is using, is guiding us through it, God's using us to, to encourage, inform, and bless someone else. All right? Amen. 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 Other thoughts on verse 12, anybody? Okay. All right. So, yeah, so Paul uh, sort of turns, he takes this, this, this situation he's going through, and, and he sort of uh, turns the corner with it and encourages others uh, to, that, that they may know that God is still with them and God will see them through when he says it is actually, yeah. And, and if you think about it, right, if we stop and think about it, think about the times in our lives where we were in a situation similar to Paul's and we look back later and realize this situation actually blessed my life. That, that had I not gone through this, there's some things I never would know about God and I never would have learned about life. Anybody remember a situation like that? Yeah, that, that, yeah that, that as we look back and sometimes in the midst of, we can stop and realize that, that this has actually served to advance what God has in store for my life. It, it may not feel good going through it. it. It may not look good. It may not be pleasant. In fact, it may be difficult and harmful and damaging. But if God, has, if God permits it, I promise you, God's not going to leave you by yourself in it. God has never left us or forsaken us. The word says he'll never leave us or forsake us. And we're witnesses of that. We don't go looking for trouble. Amen. I'm not looking to fall in the lion's den. We're not, we're not looking to go to a fiery fire. Anybody looking for trouble? No, amen. <laughs> However, every now and then, like this moment we're in right now, we find ourselves in a world that's filled with obstacles. And we have to trust that in the obstacles, God is guiding us and God can use those very obstacles to advance his calling on our lives. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's look at verse 13. Someone read for us verse 13. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So Paul, he now he's pressing. He's pressing his point, as they say. Uh, he says, uh, so that so that now, right, um, uh, all of my bonds have been been known throughout the palace. So Paul is um, what? So what he's suggesting, if you put just put some context on it. So Paul is not in an ordinary jail. Paul is in the palace of Caesar. On the on the on the on the grounds of the king, if you will, in a special jail cell, guarded by uh, the king's court guard. The, they call them the Praetorian Guard. If you watched, uh, if you watched uh, 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 Gladiator, uh, that wonderful movie about decades or two ago, uh, just this Praetorian Guard who who protected Caesar. They were his secret service, if you will, and so Paul was under their uh, supervision. And so what he's informing us is that he's saying it served to advance the gospel because now the, the, the Caesar's guards know who I am and they know I'm here because of Jesus Christ. So what he's saying is if they know I'm here because of the Lord, that means the highest level is aware. And so if they know, if the guard, if the palace guards know, right, then guess, guess who else knows? The, the people of the palace know, right? If the palace guards know, the, the palace chefs know, uh, the palace groundskeepers know. 
the, the palace courtiers know and the, and the, and the palace uh, administrators know. So if the palace guards are aware he's there because of preaching Christ, what Paul is saying is, I, I can use this obstacle as a stepping stone. I can use this, I can make utility of this obstacle for the cause of Jesus Christ. I, I, can, I can turn lemon, as Beyonce uh, paraphrased, lemons into lemonade. I can turn this thing around because God is still with me, even in this jail cell. So Paul, I think, is reminding us that these obstacles be can become utilities for us. William Prescott once said, an obstacle is often a stepping stone. That it has the ability, if we, if we, if as to Paul's words earlier, right? If we continue to love one another more and more, continue to discern, continue to be filled with God's righteousness, we can see these obstacles becoming stepping stones. They can actually be things that help to get us from where we are to where God wants us to be. Any thoughts about that? Verse 13, anybody? Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, I would say uh, not easy to do, but great point, Donna, that not only for Paul, but for us, absolutely, that God would have us to, to take advantage of these obstacles uh, best we can. So to your point, though, Donna, what, so, uh, what do you think it, it takes for us to do that? What does it take to to use these obstacles as stepping stones? What do you think? I think perhaps being filled with the Holy Spirit and staying prayerful. And that helps to remind me that God is always there with me. And if I've got an opportunity when I'm around whomever, I'll say to them, thank God. And when we show others how thankful we are, the hope is that it sends a message to them that it's all about God and that they should be thankful to. Okay. And so I try to spread that word more than I have in my life in the past. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, so being open to the Spirit's presence doesn't mean that that there's a contest of the Holy Spirit, right? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not competing with anybody for being spirit-filled, but simply means what Donna's saying is that we have to remain open to the Spirit residing in us and guiding us so that when obstacles come, that as, as we talked about earlier in verse 10 and verse 9, we don't shut down and shut the Spirit out. We welcome the Spirit in. And that's what Paul's saying let your love abound more and more. He's saying, open your heart, open your spirit, open your soul to what I have for you, even in an obstacle. Not just when things are going great, not just on payday, birthdays and holidays, not just in good times and great times, but in tough times. Keep yourself open to God's hand in your life and the movement of God's spirit in your life. And as, Donna, as you shared there, to find something to be thankful for, even there. Paul says over in chapter four of this same letter, he says, and all be anxious for nothing, right? Uh, but guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Uh, and, and then he goes on to say, uh, uh, what, whatever is good, whatever is praiseworthy, if there's anything excellent at all, if there's anything of no, anything positive to say, essentially he's saying, think on these things. So Paul says it in some ways here and certainly there in chapter four of this same letter, that we have to keep our hearts and minds open to what God is able to do. And, and that, that, yeah. yeah, that an obstacle can indeed become a stepping stone. Other thoughts though, verse 13? Yeah. Other thoughts on verse 13, 13 anybody? Yeah, yeah. Just, just, just to share what you, yesterday was the fifth anniversary of Darnell's passing. Mm. Yeah. 
a blessing and there are many different emotions that come with grief you know it's a blessing that you didn't uh, necessarily have to experience this wide gamut of emotions but we all know that grief is different for everybody amen that that yeah. creates all kinds of emotions uh, but to your point that God is able to to uh, guide us to use even grief as a stepping stone to find new levels of relationship with him New depths of care and love in God. Yep. Anybody else on verse 13? humility so we have so in terms of what we were talking about there was how do how do we find the the stepping stones in out of the obstacles using humility remaining in prayer uh, allowing the spirit to continue to guide us and being hopeful yeah other thoughts anybody god bless you Yeah. It, it adds more destruction. That's yeah. all it does. Yeah. It brings no and confusion. It brings yeah. no peace. Yeah. And Christ and he and, and, and Paul Paul knows this. Mm -hmm. And we have the same situation going on in our, in the twenty first century in our country. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and I think um I think that's a wonderful point to to, uh, to, to make Sandy and to follow through on in terms of what Paul's trying to say here in the sense that, uh, and let's, let's press in fact to verse 14, because I think you're, it's kind of, cap not kind of, I think it's captured there in more ways than one. Somebody read verse 14 for us. Okay, so, amen. amen, so so Paul talks about his chains, speaking about his, if he was prison barnacles or his, you know, his, his, uh, his, his actual stock and bond in the cell, but making, I'm sure, an illustration, uh, and to Deacon Sandy's point, we've, we've endured some chains of sorts as well in these last 18 months, whether you talk about COVID-19, whether you talk about this, the economic crisis that has rocked families that have lost jobs that have seen their children in and out of school that has uh, just turned our daily lives upside down or you want to talk about the rise of hatred and violence white supremacy and the way that people's lives have been taken senselessly uh in this country or you talk about how uh the African-American community and many minority communities have been under attack. Uh, we've seen hate crimes rise to escalating and historic levels and how all of these things represent some of the chains we have endured ourselves. And to, to your point, Deacon Sandy, that, yeah, what Paul is saying is that in those moments, our responsibility is to, as was said earlier, to remain humble, to love each other more and more. That may love may abound, he said, to, to discern, to be filled with God's righteousness. But yeah, unfortunately, what we're experiencing often here is the reverse, the opposite. 
we are often experiencing people not being more and more loving, people not being discerning, people not uh, uh, being open to the spirits filling them with righteousness, but being more uh, sort of uh, retro, uh, be about retribution and revenge, more about displaying anger and violence, more about welcoming hatred and division. And but what we know is Paul teaching us here that none of that is going to amount to anything helpful. Uh, so so he, he says, not only am I not going to allow this to turn me in the wrong direction, but he says, because of this, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So it's so it's it's as if Paul is saying this this is not only uh, a stepping stone out of this obstacle, but an opportunity for us to be stronger in the Lord, for us to strengthen the Lord's church and the Lord's fellowship among his people. And so Paul is is encouraging the church at Philippi to use his really difficult situation to become more confident in the Lord and to share the gospel without fear, to be fearless. And I think in this time, I tell you, I think with everything people are facing, trying to get through the week and the month, uh, I think more, uh, more desperately maybe than ever before, dealing with racial violence and hatred, handling uh, the, the, the continuing throes of COVID-19, trying to deal with the economy around us, thinking about the division in our country's uh, political house and trying to navigate all of that at the same time. It seems like to me, family, that people need to be reminded that God is still available, that this, this ought to be the time where the Christian church is fearless, where, where we step up to encourage people's hearts, where we step up to remind people there's hope and love available, where we, where we talk about God more and more, not that we become offensive or imposing on people, but simply that we take advantage of this opportunity to encourage the hearts of people in this world who are going through so much. To Deacon Sandy's point, yeah, we, that's so much. We, we see hatred every day. We hear more and more about this problem and that, division getting wider and wider. Uh, conflict growing uh, more and more common, violence becoming more and more every day. So it's an opportunity for us to realize people need, as the preacher said this past Sunday here at New Hope, a word from the Lord. People need encouragement and uplift and appreciation. And so this is a wonderful moment for just that. As Paul says in Philippians 1 verse 14, that we would be confident all the more and proclaim the gospel without fear. So my question is, what does that look like in our personal lives? Before we talk about the church or whatever, what does that look like? What does Paul's words in verse 14, what does that look like in our personal lives? What do you think? Okay. And when I'm talking to someone and they're really down, it's not that I, I'm poo pooing it, but I'm trying to make them understand, yeah, but look where you are. Okay. Just like you say every day, oh, thank God that he woke me up this morning. And okay. Amen. Oh. I mean, there's so much to be thankful for, so I guess we get our off remembering what we need to be thankful for rather than what we don't have. Okay. So so encouraging others, uh, you're saying, Dolores, without fear. Because, you know, as you were talking, Dolores, what I remembered as you were speaking, your words made me think of, it only takes two people to make a pity party. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so if I start grumbling and you join in, we got us a pity party going there. Right. <laughs> and so right. what you're saying is, Rather than joining in the pity parties or simply not to not to minimize anybody's trouble, but what you're saying is, I think the Lord's the way I hear it is, you're saying 
that, that we shouldn't be afraid to encourage people and remind people that there's still something to be thankful for no matter what we're going through. Without fear. Yeah, thank you for that. And that's that without fear that Paul's talking about there. That you, you're saying, no matter what someone's going through, there's still something to be thankful for. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a wonderful way for what Paul's saying to show up in our lives. Anybody else about how verse 14 can show up in our lives? Okay. Giving me another day in Christ. All right. Okay. So that's 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 one more that despite what's going on, being thankful in your individual life and leaving. And I would say, uh, Shirley, that it's important to keep that thankfulness all day long, right? Because because here's what happens. I don't know about everybody else, but I'll tell you what happens to me. I wake up that way, and then some days I go watch the news, and then I get in my car, and somebody cuts me off at the light, and you know throws me a uh, give, like this morning, as a matter of fact, somebody gave me a little less than a peace sign, and then I, 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 you know, get to where I'm going, and you know, somebody walks past and cuts you a nasty look. And if you're not careful, you might start off thankful and end up mad. So I think what's important is keeping that thankfulness all throughout the day, all day long. That with that. So when Paul says, when Paul says, uh, confident all the more, it means that in difficult times, we have to be, in difficult times, we have to be unafraid to be confident even more than in good times. That we have to be unafraid to be more confident even when there is crisis and challenge. We have to be more, con in fact, I mean, what else do we have to rely on? We have to be more confident. So if we're in a tough time, we got to be more confident that God's going to bring us through than, than, than when things aren't tough. We have to be more confident when there's challenge as opposed to when there's not challenge. So, so I think it's so important, the point you make. Anyone else, though? Ah, that's a great observation. And it encourages me that it's okay to be outnumbered, that we should just continue to bring other Donna, are you there? Hello? Oh, we might have lost her. Yeah, but she made a, an extraordinary point there. You all agree that sometimes we feel outnumbered? Anybody ever feel like that? Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, when you when you start thinking about what God has placed on your heart and how God is guiding you through a situation, you start looking at the world around you and say, man, I'm outnumbered. <laughs> It'll seem, seem like I'm the only one praying. I'm the only one thankful. I'm, I'm the only one grateful. The only one who realizes is God's grace and mercy that got me where I am. Sometimes, not that we're perfect by any stretch, but there are certainly times when we feel outnumbered, like like the 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 nays are greater than the yays, and the pessimism is greater than optimism, and negativity is greater than positivity. So that's a wonderful point Donna makes, and that that her point that when we feel outnumbered, we have to keep on trusting, and and to Paul's point, be more confident in the Lord, and and and, and proclaim the gospel without fear in that time. Not that we go being be, be, become uh, offensive or aggressive, but that we just we, we raise our confidence. That even though it appears maybe that nobody else seems to, to, to Deacon Sandy's point earlier, it seems like the world going crazy, going to hell in the handbasket. We have to be confident that God is still in charge. That doesn't mean that things are going to be good tomorrow now. I ain't talking about that. That doesn't mean I'm not talking about pie in the sky. That ain't my thing. I'm not talking about all the troubles of the world that's going to go away. No, that's not going to happen. Not, not, no, not by some hard work and effort. But what it means is that we are, even though it appears that 
the majority of society may be turning in a way that is obviously away from God and obviously away from the betterment of people, we have to trust that though we may be outnumbered in the world, the, the Bible tells us, right, the greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. So we're never outnumbered because God's on our side. And so we have to be remain more and more confident that God can guide us through even when we feel like we're the minority report. Even when we're That's like uh, when, remember when uh, Joshua and Caleb in the Old Testament book of Numbers, uh, Moses told the uh, 12 people, go over to Canaan, spy out the land, tell us what you see. They all came back. 10 people said, no, we can't make it over there, boss. Got to go. <laughs> Joshua and Caleb said, no. He said, God is with us and God can give us this land. So they were outnumbered, but they were confident in the Lord, and they decided to say so without fear. Again, I do not believe God is calling us to be offensive, to be imposing, to be disrespectful. That's not a Christ. What God is calling us to do is to be fearless in how we love one another. To, to Sister Dolores' point, to how we remain thankful and how we see the good in every situation. And how we remind ourselves God's still on our side. Other thoughts, though. I'm, I'm over talking. Other thoughts on verse 14. Well, Pastor, I just wanted to reference a scripture uh, talking about confidence in Isaiah 30. All right. 15, a portion of 15. Yeah. It reads, In quietness and confidence show your strength. Okay. Amen. Amen. All right. So sometimes we don't have to say a word, but that confidence in God. Uh, and who God is in our lives. All right. Amen. Other thoughts, anybody? Amen. Okay. And just a reminder, um, trust in the Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so Paul, uh, we'll, we'll close here at verse 14 when he says, because of my chains. And again, we think about the, the, the emotional, the mental, spiritual chains that, that we've all faced to some degree or another. Uh, if you remember last year, uh, the former first lady of the United States, uh, Michelle Obama, said she was dealing with depression, said she was emotionally overwhelmed. Uh, we, we look to... Uh, to, to corporations, great and small, or who are unable to deliver products and make revenue. We look at whole countries, even today, that are still shut down. Uh, we look at our own lives that have changed drastically, and we realize that none of us have escaped some of these chains. But what Paul is trying to say is, regardless of whatever sort of chain comes into our lives, whether it's a community, as a people, as a nation, that we, we ought to be confident in the Lord and be willing to share what we know, who we know God to be in our lives without fear. If to know him but ourselves, to be not afraid that God will continue to be with us and God will continue to watch over us. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, thank you all so much today for sharing Philippians chapter 1 when verses uh, 9 through 14 thereabouts. We enjoyed this time. We're going to close our, our stream today, but want to encourage you all who may have just signed on to, uh, to be welcome to go back and view the remainder of it and join us again next Tuesday at 1230 Mountain Time. We thank you for uniting with us today. Praise God for your comments and reflections and feedback on the stream, and we'll see you again next week. God bless you.